this week on Christian World News, moments after her son was born, he was taken away. But decades of searching and praying finally paid off. See the amazing mother and child reunion that was 50 years in the making. Plus, the church plays matchmaker. How Chinese pastors are helping singles find their mates. And spiritual revival that swept the globe. And how the prayers of a 19th century nun helped it make it happen. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. My colleague Wendy Griffith is on vacation. A mother is reunited with her son nearly 50 years after losing him. Her child was taken during the Vietnam War, but she never gave up hope of seeing him again. Charlene Aaron shows us how decades of persistent prayer finally paid off. At two years old, Kirk Keller Halls was adopted from an orphanage in Vietnam. After growing up in America raised by Christian parents, the 47-year-old never imagined meeting his biological mother. I've grown up ever since I was old enough to know that I was adopted with the notion that my parents perished in the Vietnam War. But that's not what happened. I know it's been a, a few long days for me. I can't, <laughs> can't imagine how long this trip has been for her. This amazing turnaround began just weeks after Keller Halls received an email from a woman urging him to give her a call. Hello? Yes, hello, do that call? Uh, yes, I'm uh, returning a call to this number. I am looking for my son. I've been looking for him for, for a long time, and I believe you are my son. Fast forward to June 6, 2017, when CBN News documented the long-awaited moment for Keller Halls and his birth mother, Twi Nati Niblet. Niblet and her husband drove from San Antonio to Virginia oh, Beach God. for the emotional reunion. <laughs> Thank you so much, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for bringing my son to me. Thank you, you so much. Me. Oh, God, I love you, I love son. You. <laughs> Thank you so much, God. Thank you, Jesus. I know you know where my son is. Niblet became pregnant at just 17 during the Vietnam War. She says when her father learned of the pregnancy, he became angry because she wasn't married. Plus, the father was an American soldier. She told us what her father did the day her son was born. Took the baby right after I happened. I knew it was a boy. I know it was a boy. Niblet also suffered physical abuse for refusing to go along with a hastily arranged marriage. Keller Hall's biological father transferred to another military base and never knew about the pregnancy. The two eventually lost contact. Niblet came to the U.S. in 1971 and never stopped praying that she would one day find her son. After many disappointments, she turned to the internet and family tree DNA just two years ago. Meanwhile, Keller Halls had hesitated to look, although he had always wanted to know more about his birth family. Finally, he decided to take a chance and just days after going to the same website was notified about a possible match. It said parent-child match, um, I just kind of shook my head and thought, no, that's, there's a mistake, there's, that's impossible. That unlikelihood turned out to be the answer to his mother's unwavering prayers. I, I just knew that, that it was my son because I didn't pray. Days after connecting with his mom, Keller Halls also met a brother and sister he never knew existed. Family members are thankful for this once in a lifetime opportunity. God has always been faithful. And it's, this has all happened in his timing, and um, we're grateful for that. I feel blessed. What are you going to call Grandma? Uh, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Keller Halls and Niblet hope their story inspires others. Keep continue believing. Sooner or later, God go to open that door. We have to be patient. We have to be faithful, as Mom put mm -hmm. it, uh, and trust in his perfect timing. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Oh, what a beautiful reunion. Well, summer is the time for weddings, like young people everywhere. Some in China are having trouble finding their perfect match. However, Chinese church leaders are finding creative ways to help singles find true love. Meng Fei Li has that story. 
on a beautiful sunny Saturday morning in Beijing. These young Chinese do something unusual here: Irish dancing in the park. Besides enjoying the fun, the main purpose is to help single Christians find their true love. Some Christians prayed for years that Mr. or Mrs. Wright would show up. They passionately sought the right person. Some even went to church leaders for help. God called us to be in relationships with one another. Our church is like a family. We want to help them find the right ones who are also part of our Christian network. We have many unmarried, amazing brothers and sisters. They deserve to marry the right people. That's what motivated us to plan such a huge event. These young people get to know each other by playing group games. This one requires them to find scripture verses hidden in bushes. I'm so happy to see that everybody is having a great time. Praise the Lord! It also brought many first timers too. My pastor told me about it, and I am so glad that I came. Since 2012, many local churches in Beijing have organized a similar annual event. Through prayer and attending fun activities, many have found the right person God has prepared for them. Liu Tieyang was single for eight years. Before attending the church programs, he tried many times on his own to find his future wife, but that always ended in disappointment. He started believing there was no right person waiting for him. Church leaders encouraged him to be patient and faithful. They were afraid that he would miss a blessing from God. When we are vulnerable and disappointed, we tend to compromise our principles. We need to remind ourselves that God is in control, and He has the perfect solution for our puzzlement. Trust in Him is very important. Later on, he began to take part in church fellowship meetings. Soon, he met his future wife, Ji Xiangchun. After being married for eight months, I still can't believe that I found a beautiful and lovely wife. We have our own family today. Most importantly, we were able to grow together in the Lord. God brought us together. Lu's wife believes her husband is a gift from the Lord. My husband is such a caring and sweet person. He loves me so much. We want to encourage other singles to trust in Jesus. He has the perfect timing. Beijing church leaders are hoping more Christians and non-Christians will join these singles program and come to realize that God should always be at the center of any relationship. And if they will wait on Him, they will find their perfect match. <laughs> Meng Fei Li, CBN News. Up next, the Pope, the Nun. And the Holy Spirit. See how spiritual transformation swept the Catholic Church. Folks, there's a power beyond the realm of human intellect. In Pat Robertson's new DVD, Miracles, learn how you can experience God's power in your life. You've said that there are three components to seeing miracles. What do you mean by that? A power that can overcome any problem. This is the normal inheritance of the children of God. And see inspirational true stories of miracles. Meet the real people who have come face to face with that power. Medicine cannot explain this. I felt the strength of God come. I am being healed. Call 1-800-700-7000 to get your copy of Miracles. Experience God's power in your life. I felt God saying, "I am in complete control." This was a dead man. Now he's alive. It's definitely a miracle. Miracles. Experience God's power in your life. Available now. Life. It's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it. I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day.
At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. And welcome back to Christian World News. The Pentecostal charismatic renewal has transformed Christian churches in the 20th century. 50 years ago, it hit the Catholic Church. And today, there are more than 100 million charismatic Catholics. But none of it would have happened without the prayers of a nun from the 19th century. Elena Guerra was devoted to her faith from a young age and established her own congregation in 1866 in order to educate young women. Her deepest passion was to see the Holy Spirit renew the world. Elena said things about the Holy Spirit like, if only, if only we would want Him, if only we would seek Him, if only we would pray to Him, He would surely come. Between 1895 and 1903, Sister Elena penned 12 confidential letters to Pope Leo XIII. She urged the Pope to lead the church back to the upper room, to a posture of expectant prayer displayed by the apostles, Mary, the mother of Christ, and other believers before Pentecost. Elena wanted the church to experience a perpetual Pentecost. And the amazing thing is the Pope took it very seriously and in fact responded to that. Prompted by Elena's letters, Pope Leo called for a special time of prayer each year between Ascension Day and Pentecost. The bishops and cardinals soon lost passion for the special prayers, but Elena did not. She encouraged the Pope to teach more fully on the Holy Spirit, which inspired him to write a letter to the bishops. The letter, titled Divinum Illidmunus, emphasized the indwelling and miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. A landmark document on the Holy Spirit, it's still looked back to today as, as just a milestone of writing on the Holy Spirit. Still not satisfied, Elena urged Pope Leo to invoke the hymn Veni Creator Spiritus, Come Holy Spirit over the first day of the new century. Pope Leo XIII went into St. Peter's Basilica and surrounded by the bishops and cardinals of the church, sang in a solemn way, Veni Creator Spiritus, Come Creator Spirit. And he solemnly dedicated and consecrated the 20th century to the Holy Spirit. And of course, at the very same time, January 1st, 1901, in Topeka, Kansas, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the little group there gathered at the Bethel Bible School. Agnes Osmond, a student at the Bible School, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues late New Year's Day after prayer and the laying on of hands. Her experience, echoed by several other students, sparked the modern Pentecostal movement. You see this amazing uh, convergence of prayer to the Lord for uh, a new coming of the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting that something was happening in Rome on January 1st, 1901, with the Pope calling down the Holy Spirit. And then in Topeka, Kansas, we have the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. So it's very interesting how the Lord uh, began the 20th century by pouring out His Holy Spirit that way. By 1906, members of the Bethel Bible School group, most notably William J. Seymour, were leading the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. Healing, salvations, and the renewed power to witness all flowed from Azusa Street, just as signs and wonders flowed from the upper room of the Disciples' Day. We owe a great debt to our Protestant brothers and sisters who have been witnesses to the reality of the Holy Spirit for so many years. Sister Elena's prayers again bore fruit in 1958, when white smoke billowed from the chimney over the Sistine Chapel, signaling the election of Pope John XXIII, who, like Sister Elena, longed for the Holy Spirit to renew the church. He said the Holy Spirit had inspired him to reset the church's relationship with the world. It was time. As we see the hostility to Christ and the church that's growing in our culture, people are realizing, you know what? If we keep on doing business as usual, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. In 1962, Pope John convened a church council, later called Vatican II, hoping to pave the way for Christian unity. He asked Christians everywhere to join him 
and joyfully echo his prayer to the Holy Spirit. Renew your wonders in our time, as though for a new Pentecost. He was looking for energy. He was looking for power from on high. He was looking for God to do something. He was looking for a new Pentecost. And so he anticipated that Vatican II was going to open the windows of the church to the Holy Spirit and apparently to signs and wonders. When we come back, our story continues. We'll show you how one of the most disruptive decades in history actually helped spread a spiritual renewal. Pat Robertson's new DVD, Miracles. Hey, it was God. Meet real people who have experienced God's life-saving power. God was taking care of us. You'll discover the three components of miracles, the power of your words, and the abundant kindness and mercy God has for you. Remember to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and you will receive. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. When Pope John convened Vatican II in the early 60s, he hoped to see a major breakthrough of the Holy Spirit. While he didn't live to see that happen, his call for spiritual renewal came just at the right time. Pope John passed away in 1963 before Vatican II concluded. He was succeeded by Pope Paul VI, who found the world devolving into chaos. A new generation was thumbing its nose at convention, Students took to the streets in protest. Turbulence ruled the decade. At that point, a lot of people were questioning everything and questioning God. David Mangan was a graduate student in physics at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. He belonged to the Kiro Society, a group of Catholic students who met before classes to pray and study scripture. Hungry for more of God and seeking this new Pentecost, they went away together on retreat at the Ark and the Dove, in February 1967. And then we were uh, given a little paperback book uh, called The Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkerson, who was a Pentecostal pastor who worked with drug addicts and in miraculous ways brought them to uh, healing and salvation merely through prayer. I kept saying, this is happening today. Well, why aren't these things happening in my life? I thought, here I am, I'm baptized. I'm confirmed, I've received the Holy Spirit. Why isn't the Holy Spirit doing this in my life? Patty Mansfield was a 20-year-old French major at Duquesne when she attended the retreat. And we were told to do three things. First, pray with expectant faith. Expect that this retreat was going to do something for us. The next thing was to take the Bible and read the first four chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. To tell you how ignorant I was of the Scripture, I had no idea where to find the Acts of the Apostles. I figured it was the New Testament because I knew the Apostles were in the time of Jesus. The students opened each session of the retreat with the hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, Come Holy Spirit, the same hymn Pope Leo invoked over the 20th century. 
One of the speakers taught from Jesus' words in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The word for power is the same Greek word where we in English would get the word dynamite. And he likened the coming of the Holy Spirit to dynamite. And that struck me extremely deeply because although I've been raised a good Catholic boy and I was with the Lord, you know, he hadn't abandoned me at all and I knew that that's where I, was, where I belonged and where I was. But I don't think I could have used the word dynamite as an adjective to describe my spiritual life at that point. David joined his small group session and asked a question. Where is the dynamite? He later recorded in his notes his desire to hear someone speak in tongues. And then I put a dash and I put me with an exclamation point. David went off by himself to reflect on the teaching. When I opened the door and walked into the chapel, the presence of God was so powerful I could hardly move. The only way I could say it is I was lost in Christ and happy to be so. And I completely forgot about all my pushing to say, where's the dynamite, where's the dynamite? And that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like little explosions in my body were going off as part of this whole experience. I, I don't even know how to describe it beyond that. I started opening my mouth to thank God for what he had done, and I start praying in another language. Later, Patty joined David in the chapel. I began to tremble. I remember thinking, but God is here. <laughs> And he's holy, and I'm not holy. And so just kneeling there in the quiet of my heart, I said, Father, I give my life to you. Whatever you ask, I accept it. I was lying there prostrate, and I felt immersed in the love of God. I felt like I was swimming in the mercy of God. I remember thinking, just saying to him, stay, stay, stay. Other students were also drawn into the chapel. Some people were laughing for joy. Others were weeping for joy. Some said they felt like they wanted to praise God, but they didn't know if it was going to come out in English. And anyway, we were there and um, just in awe, just in awe of the sovereign God. Everything changed at that point. Now, I didn't spot it all right away, but I mean, everything was different as, as it turned after, after this happened to me. The small gathering of Duquesne students who walked away from that retreat center say they were never the same. But what they didn't know at the time was that their life-changing experience was meant to be shared. And it was just the beginning. Just the beginning indeed. Stay with us, we'll be back right after this. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. 
It's an annual event that packs thousands into football stadium and more into churches and venues worldwide. Chart-topping recording artists perform, but in the end, Jesus is the star. Ephraim Graham takes us to the Harvest America Crusade. It's a hundred degrees here in Phoenix. Phil Wickham, Need to Breathe, and Mercy Me are also singing at this year's Harvest America Crusade. Boys, thank you telling me I'm not right. Nearly eight million people have attended Harvest events online or in person, and nearly a half million have made professions of faith. Those numbers climb even higher this year with the event here at the home of the Cardinals, University of Phoenix Stadium. Let's welcome Mel Gibson to the Harvest Crusade. Actor and director Mel Gibson made a surprise appearance last year. And this year's crusade isn't short on surprises. And I saw God transform him from a man that I hated into the man I wanted to become. Mercy Me shares a bit of the feature film based on their mega hit, I Can Only Imagine. Not due in theaters until spring of 2018. I'm Greg Laurie, and I am a huge Steve McQueen fan. He's a Hollywood icon. Pastor Greg Laurie gives audience a sneak peek at his film, the untold story of acting legend Steve McQueen's journey to faith, scheduled to hit theaters in the fall. It's never too late to come home. Yes. Never, ever, 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 ever. He loves you. He loves and you. American Idol's Jordan Sparks reveals an emotional faith journey of her own, following her big win in 2007. You know, she won American Idol at 17. She became a huge success, has had a very great, uh, fantastic career, but drifted from her faith. You know, she was raised in the church and loved the Lord as a young girl. She drifted and she came back to Christ about a year ago. So for me, I was sort of wondering, what is the meaning of my life? Jordan's testimony sets the stage for Pastor Lori's sermon tonight. Sin promises freedom but it brings slavery. The biblical story of the prodigal son, whose father gracefully receives him when he humbly returned after wasting his inheritance in a life on the run from doing what was right. June 12th, the Monday following, how do you measure impact or change when the conference or the, the crusade is done? Well, for us, you know, our profit margin is people coming to Christ. I want to help people get ready for heaven. When it's all said and done, everyone's basically the same. Everyone's empty. Everyone's lonely. Everyone is afraid to die. Everybody has the same basic human need. And Christ died for our sins on the cross. And we can all be forgiven. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Phoenix, Arizona. Thanks, Ephraim. By the way, Greg Lowry's eva uh, Harvest Evangelism reports that about 33,000, 3,300, sorry, people came to Christ through the event. Well, folks, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.